Welcome to Faculty Insight, brought to you by Harvard Extension School in partnership with ThoughtCast. I'm Jenny Atia, and I'm speaking with Donald Pfister, the Asa Gray Professor of Systematic Botany at Harvard University, curator of the Farlow Library and Herbarium, and dean of Harvard Summer School. Don, it seems that your first love is for the fungus, but you've also reserved some of your attention for the forests of New England. In fact, you teach a course on this at Harvard Extension School. How far back does our knowledge go of these forests? Well, I, th I think our knowledge begins with the idea that New England was at one point completely uh, scraped of forests and land with the uh, the glaciation that occurred in the Pleistocene. And then forests began to move back into New England. And we know a good deal about the composition of those forests based on um, what we can tell from the fossil record. And those fossils are primarily in the form of pollen. So one can go out and collect the, the pollen, uh, place it, and know what those forests were like in the past. Apparently in about 1600, 96% of New England was covered in forest? That's right. But in many parts of New England, of course, there were uh, the Native Americans, and the, the Native Americans uh, were using forest products, uh, were in some cases burning uh, areas in the forest. So 96%, uh, but uh, with interruptions. On view at Harvard's Fisher Museum in Petersham, Massachusetts, are an incredible set of dioramas which depict the change over time of New England forests. And thanks to the Harvard forest, we're allowed to see these dioramas. For example, this one, dated 1700, represents an old growth forest, as it would have appeared before European colonists settled in the area. Don, can you describe the kinds of trees we're looking at here? The types of trees are beech and maple and oaks. And as you look across the diorama, you'll see that there are some large uh, trees. There are also significant understory, lower trees within that uh, landscape. Uh, there's a sense that there's an opening in the center of the diorama, and that might represent a tree fall. The European settlers did begin to move in, of course, and they began to cut down these trees in the forests to make houses, make room for fields, grow crops. And of course, the forest began to look a bit more domesticated, as we can see in this second diorama. What happens when this forest starts to become more tame? Well, it becomes tame in the sense that the, the trees are confined to smaller areas. Uh, it becomes a, uh, a different kind of ecosystem. It's much more fragmented, uh, pieces of forest scattered around. But uh, let me ask you a question. Have you ever dug a hole in a New England field? Have you ever dug and, and tried to turn over the soil? In I've those contemplated fields? it, but not done it. You've not Is done it. Fair? What do you think you would find <laughs> if you rocks. did this? You rocks. find rocks. And <laughs> Uh, one of the things that New Englanders found fairly quickly on was that it was just full of stones and rocks. And that's partly uh, has to do with the geology of the area, having had this glaciation and deposits of material uh, with the glacier. So the soil was not very good. And if you look at this diorama, there are these woodlots, of course. But there's also stone walls, and those stone walls uh, are a characteristic of New England farms and New England forests these days. And they're the hard, hard work of those early settlers on the land that was not very good. What's interesting, Don, is at the same time that these farms were opening up in the Northeast, moving into the forest, technology was opening up opportunities in the West. The Erie Canal opened movement from the east to the west in 1825, I believe. Right. When we begin to tie together this idea of uh, the farms themselves not being very uh, sustainable, and then uh, the discoveries in the west, and as we move west, there uh, are deep, rich soils. Uh, 
farming is much easier, uh, fewer rocks and fewer uh, of the obstacles in New England. And so uh, the Erie Canal is a good example of people being able to move west, but also goods being able to move from the west to the east. So in a sense, the, the heartland, this opening west, was provisioning uh, the east with food, with materials, uh, opening forests in the, the west as well for exploitation. This slowly leads to the abandonment of these farms in the Northeast. And these plots that had been cleared of trees end up fallow. They are uh, fallow in a sense, but it also opens up a very new habitat. And that habitat is uh, one that will support trees that can live in direct sunlight and we see this today. If you travel down a road in New England, the edge of the road is filled with white pine. And if we look at the, the dioramas, for example, and begin to think about what those forests looked like, the abandonment led to a reestablishment of the forests. And the reestablishment of the forests was through white pines. And those white pines uh, were almost all of the same age because they were coming into this, these plots at the same time. Eventually, people noticed that these trees had value. And they thought, oh, let's cut them down. And then they discovered that there were other trees <laughs> that had been growing, sheltered by the white pine, hidden in their shadow, so to speak, the, the second growth, the understory, and they were little saplings of hardwood trees. Right, right. It's a, a very interesting set of uh, biological uh, coincidences here that uh, these white pines were providing shelter for trees that needed to have uh, shade to germinate and become established. And those were mostly hardwoods. And they were able to sustain themselves in the shade when the white pines were cut they were more or less released. They could begin to grow and form these hardwood forests that we often see today. Henry David Thoreau coined a term for this kind of growth. That's right. That's succession is what he called this. But his, what he looked at and what he was trying to do was to uh, solve this mystery that we have white pines, but we know if we cut down white pine uh, that will have these hardwoods come in. So how does that happen? <laughs> and part of it has to do with the, the way that squirrels and animals are carrying around seeds, that they're planting them in the forests, uh, and that these then are providing this next generation of trees. Don, this final image from the Fisher Museum is actually a photograph of the forest as it is today, taken by the director of the Harvard Forest, David Foster. Yes, the forest is really quite wonderful today. It's a success story. Uh, about 80% of the landscape is now forested in New England. And if you remember, it was 40% or so in earlier times. So this has been a success in a number of ways. Not only do we have a forested landscape to look at and for recreation, but those forests also these days are serving as a carbon sink. That is, carbon from the atmosphere is being stored in the wood of those forests. And this has contributed greatly to the balance of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Final question, Don. Knowing what the challenges are for forests today in New England, where do you project they will be, say, 50 years from now? Well, I think we'll uh, still have a forested landscape. I think that in much of New England, uh, we'll be thinking about management practices that allow us to use timber and responsibly use the forests as they have grown back. I think that we do have to think about climate change and what the distributions of these plants will be in the future. Don Fister, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. You've been watching Faculty Insight, brought to you by Harvard Extension School in partnership with ThoughtCast. I'm Jenny Atia. Thanks for joining us.